okay. Uh, now to introduce you to Artworks Downtown. If you don't know about Artworks Downtown, our mission is to provide an environment where visual arts thrive for the well-being of our community. And this art talk is one of the ways we do that. Uh, Artworks Downtown is a nonprofit organization that owns and operates an art center in a historic 40,000 square foot building, which includes four galleries, 35 studios, multi-purpose rooms, ceramic center, jewelers guild, restaurant, frame shop, and 17 low-income housing units. Uh, we are located in downtown San Rafael, California, on the indigenous lands of the coast Miwok. Uh, so um, tonight's program uh, happens due to uh, the uh, ingenious planning of our board and our, our former board members and many volunteers, but it's also largely largely encouraged, happens, excuse me, uh, thanks to support from uh, the community. So if you're able to uh, financially contribute tonight, we appreciate it. Occasionally, I will uh, paste uh, a link in the chat room where you can access a donation page. Of course, you can also go to our website, www.artworksdowntown.org. Yeah, the, the exhibition is available to be viewed by the public Thursday through Saturday, 1 to 8 p.m., in downtown San Rafael at 1337 4th Street. So I hope you're able to see the um, really dynamic and, and thought-provoking presentation that Deanna and the exhibitors have put together. Now a quick introduction for Deanna Pindell. Uh, she is a public artist, educator, curator, writer, arts administrator, and a wonderful person to work with. Uh, Ecological art grounded in science and created in the commons has been Deanna Pindell's spent passion for four decades. Indigenous rights, multi-species justice, forest habitat, and water quality are among the issues she has addressed through her profession. She explores the complexity of these concerns, collaborates with scientists and stakeholders, and proposes functional remediative solutions when possible. A bioremediation island in Cambodia, a stormwater swale play area in North Carolina, playfully interactive state park signage in Washington, and the addition of indigenous language way markers to a campus in Washington are just some examples. Deanna received her MFA in interdisciplinary art at Goddard College and is now faculty at Olympic College, Washington. Her writings have been published in the book Eco Art in Action and in Atena, Journal of Nature in Visual Culture. She has won several grants and awards for her work, and she serves on the board of WEED, Women, Women Echo Arts Artists Dialogue. So uh, this is a collaboration with WEED and uh, certainly a collaboration with Deanna. And now I'm going to pass it to Deanna and let her take it away. So thank you, everybody. Thank you, Stan. I very much appreciate it and very generous. Stan is also a delightful person to work with, just got to say it. So, um, and so, yeah, I'm Deanna Pindell, and I am talking to you from northwestern corner of Washington State on in the Coast Salish region and Jamestown Sklalem tribe um, territory in particular. And so I've been asked to start with a very short introduction to what is eco art in general, um, and then uh, we'll go into the exhibit. Um, I want to say that we are missing a couple of our presenters due to the windy weather tonight. Um, so uh, hopefully we'll all make it, but um, I, I'm sure you understand. Okay, so I'm going to. Um, Mm -mm -mm. Uh, slide, slide, slide. Whoops. Slideshow. Sorry. Play from start. And wait, I'm not sharing my screen, am I? Okay. You're not. There we go. And share. And slideshow play from start okay so um very briefly 
I, I and the um, the collaborators I work with, we think of eco art as art that integrates society and ecology, um, going beyond just the the gallery work. But you may have heard of some of these other. Uh, names for artwork that happens out in the community, out in the world, away from the gallery walls. And so you can see there's a lot of overlap. We don't need to get too hung up on the specifics of the... Um, mm, I, my, there we go. We don't need to get too specific about the um, real definitions, because there's always controversy about that, you know, as now that we're right in the middle of it happening. But um, eco art in particular happens a lot with science and a lot out in the community. So some of you, where did eco art as we know it now come from? You may have heard in the 1960s and 1970s, land art became, um, uh, burst out really from the gallery. Robert Smithson and his spiral jetty over there and Andy Goldsworthy are two really widely known um, people who work in slightly different variations of the genre. Smithson is dead and Goldsworthy is still extremely productive, which is great. Um, so land art left the gallery and started making art out in the world and so that you couldn't really own it you could only own the documentation the photographs or whatever was brought back to the gallery to show um and sorry i have a little trouble with my mouse so um but one thing it didn't do was think about the environment very well. They made a lot of art, but didn't really think about ecology. At the same time, in the 60s and 70s, we all remember that there was a lot of different movements, civil rights, feminist, things like that. And Merle Lucales was became known after she became a mother, she realized that she wanted to identify the work she does, the maintenance work that she does to keep the world going as an art form in and of itself. So she's made a full career out of that. And so the broader movement would be called conceptual art where the idea is um, more important. So as an artwork, she's talking about us needing to think about what makes something art and why are certain kinds of activity art and others not. So she was, she was very influential with that. She's in here, you see, she's washing the steps of the museum rather than showing her work inside. And then she became the artist in residence at New York City for a couple decades, I think. So we see her there. Um, and then Joseph Boyce was really one who changed the thinking to what I would call um, today eco art um, and socially engaged art. Whoops, sorry about that. I know that's annoying. Um, so Joseph Boyce is the man with the fedora and the shovel full of dirt. And this artwork is 7,000 oaks where he literally, Germany was deforested really badly and he was an activist about ecological concerns. And so this artwork is he literally planted 7,000 oaks and each one of them um, with a basalt stone to mark them as being part of the artwork. So you see the beautiful um, pathway with the jogger and the trees where they have grown and the basalt still stays there. You may have heard of the phrase that everybody is an artist or every human being is an artist and that comes from Joseph Boyce and his concept here is that the society as a whole is one huge artwork 
and that everybody is creatively contributing to the total artwork, which is our society. So whatever we do, whether we contribute by trying to make our total artwork, our society better or not, um, is that we, he, we don't, he doesn't want to separate necessarily what any particular action is, whether it's art or whether it's not. It's like, that's, um, and so that really profoundly changed the um, art world. And so I'm just, that's, I'm just giving you a tiny bite right there. These are three organizations that I'm involved with that you can go to to learn more about eco art or ecological art. And then, and here are two books. The one on the right is the catalog for the current show. The one on the left is um, for, it's designed for classrooms and communities and people who want to learn how to become, how to take their art and, and become more involved as an eco artist. So I have a piece in there and was a co-editor as well. So um, there you have that. And um, and so now I'm gonna um, whoops end the show. And if you have more questions about that, write them down, and we'll save them for the um, whoops stop share. Sorry about that. Um, um, excuse me, my. Am I not? Am I sharing now or not? I think I'm not. Not okay. Perfect. Um, yeah, as artists, not all. Some of us are technical, technologically adept, and not all. So my idea with this exhibit was to really try to stick very narrowly to that thesis of looking for work that that whatever was coming into the gallery would represent some kind of a project out in the world that was um, working towards uh, our climate, facing our climate change issues, um, whether it's doing a remediation project or educating people and, um, and uh, so, so yeah, something, anything that would make an impact. And as I started working it and researching, since they're all Bay Area artists and I'm in the Northwest, I had to do quite a bit of research, but I discovered that all of the artists that I was choosing in some way had the element of play, play as part of their, um, as part of their artwork. Some of it is really direct because some of the artists created actual games that we would recognize as, as games. Um, some of them are, are using play as more of a theatrical form or a sculptural form. But in every case, I think this fits well with modern um, contemporary psychological theory about games, which is that we are hardwired to learn through um, games whether or not they actually look like a video game or look like a board game or something, but it's that play activity that's important. So now I'm going to um, turn it over to each of the artists who have been able to make it today. And we're going to start with um, Michelle. Are you ready? Yes, I am ready and I'm going to share my screen. So bear with me just one second. And there you go. Okay. So hello from the Mojave Desert, uh, where I am actually uh, doing an artist residency in 29 pounds and tonight it's super, super stormy. So I hope it will hold, it should hold for the few minutes I will present, uh, we should be fine. Um, so um, down to earth, um, this participatory installation uh, attempts to represent the complexity of our multi-crisis or predicament, uh, ecology, economy, equity, and energy. 
it, it took me a lot of time to start understanding the connections. And I wanted to share what I had learned. And the problem I think is that most people still do not get what is at stake. Uh, the installation does not hide words like greenwashing or opium, uh, equity and questioning everything are part of the responses. So I want to, to, to go back on this idea of, of, of climate change. Um, so my perspective, uh, I'm, I'm not the only one in, in, in that case, of course, that climate change is not the problem. Uh, climate change is the symptom of a system that puts profit before life and transforms nature into waste. And uh, by doing that, it kills life on Earth. So human, humans are taking much more resources than Earth's capacity can replenish, and human activities are powered primarily by cheap, accessible fossil fuels, especially oil. And I think it's not necessarily in the center of our uh, discussions. Oil is a great energy that combines concentration, easy transportation, and storage. And there is no, uh, uh, it's, it's not by chance that we are using it so much. So, but because of the damage fossil fuels caused to the biosphere, we'll have to stop using them. We must be prepared to use less or none, which means drastic changes in people's lives. Oil is everywhere in our daily life, whether we see it or not. Anything we do and use has something to do with oil. So in this installation and, and all of my installations really, I'm trying to minimize the impact uh, of my work. I use very little material and everything uh, will be reused for another installation uh, iteration. Uh, hopefully there will be another iteration of this one. Uh, I mostly work outdoors. This one is indoor and it's great for public participation. In my view, each item is precious not in terms of money, of course, but because of the hidden process behind it. Think about a nail, for example. The, 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 the smallest thing you can use in an installation, right? If you use nails, usually we use nails. Okay, the extraction of raw materials it represents, the transportation, the production, the manufacturing of boxes, the retailing, and all the oil needed in the machines along the process, just for nails. So imagine all the rest. And I think that is quite fascinating, scary and fascinating. Um, so the words and sentences I use in the installation come from scientific readings, podcasts I'm listening to and books. And I have to say, I listen and read a lot about just that, the predicaments. I think it's fascinating, scary, but really super important. And the people who inspired me to do this installation are many. And they include Richard Einberg from the Post Carbon Institute and Nate Higgins, whose podcast, The Great Simplification, I highly recommend, uh, addresses the inevitable simplification of our too complex, not to fail system. There are also quotes from climate scientists like Peter Kalmus, who is exceptionally active in sharing the truth. So Down to Earth is a tribute to limits to growth, which was published in 1972 for at least 50 years, but way more. We, we have known that a finite planet has no infinite growth and yet business as usual prevails. Despite, despite all the cops, the conferences of the parties and alarmed scientists screaming that there is no more time, we continue. We are being gaslit in believing some miraculous solution will allow us to continue what we do by simply transitioning to renewable energy. Renewable energies are good, but they will not replace the power of fossil fuels. Renewable energy infrastructure is possible because of fossil fuels. Think extraction of all the materials, production of the parts, transportation. It's always this, this, the same um, process, right? For anything a nail or um, a windmill. Um, it is difficult to hear that we live on a finite planet and must change our lifestyle. Let's imagine that the transition to renewable is possible. 
we still we will still have growing inequalities, deforestation, loss of wild territories, overfishing, pollution from many chemicals, water scarcity, sea level rise, and ocean acidification. By now, the climate change force is out of the barn. For example, we will not stop the ice from melting. There is inertia in the climate change process. The damage will not disappear, but we could curb further damage. That is why I prefer the term responses rather than solutions. So in these blue tags here on this side, all the, the right side of the installation, there are the responses, the possible responses, and there are many. So visitors going to see the installations are invited to share thoughts, poems, ideas, or drawings on tags and place them on pieces of driftwood peppered throughout the installation. So an installation like Down to Earth could incentivize people to want to understand better what is at stake. It, for me, it's, it, it's still the most important. Try to understand before even thinking about solutions. The, the, that's the core of, of what we face is that, is like running to solutions too fast. In a finite world, continuing on the same trajectory is impossible. Either we decide to slow down and change our priorities from profit to life, or nature will take care of the descent, but not in a nice way for humans. Going back down to earth is an urgent necessity if we want a chance at keeping a livable planet. And finally here, we have some of the 250 tags from people who participated in the previous iteration of the installation. Um, it's very encouraging to see that. And it's really, as an artist, I, I love doing this and getting all feedback. So we cannot change physics or natural laws. Many beautiful projects can flourish from the necessity to change our system. The one we create that we can change. Envisioning other ways to live is exciting. What are our priorities in these un unique times? How do we value all other forms of life on earth? How might we redefine success and happiness? Thank you. Oof, my, my, my image is very weird. Okay, <laughs> can I stop sharing? Thank you. Thank you, Michelle. Lovely. All right. So remember, if you have any questions for Michelle, be sure and put them in the chat. And um, she can put a link to um, her web page or uh, the name of the book or something if she would like to do that. Um, Zach, are you ready to go next? All right. Sure. Hi, everybody. I'm Zach Pine. I'm living in unceded Ohlone territory, now known as Berkeley, California. And um, I have three photos in this exhibit. They're all part of a project called Sand Globes Worldwide. I'm gonna share a brief video um, and uh, leave my presentation at that. This project is like all of my work. It's very simple. Um, I feel like it's foundational for the resilience that we need and for the responses that Michelle talked about, um, for us to feel connected to the earth and to feel connected to each other because people take care of what they're connected to. So that's what this project is about. I'll share my screen and show you the video. If the video isn't working, will you please let me know? And there it is. Do you see a picture with a sand globe? Yes. Yes. Right, there it comes. If the sound isn't working, just give a shout. I'm Zach Pine, a socially engaged environmental artist based in California. Sand Globes Worldwide is my project using sand globe making as a way to connect people all over the planet to coastal areas and to each other. I see this as a foundation for creative and collaborative environmental action.
I don't hear sound, Zach. Oh, there's no sound in that. People I encountered on the beach wanted to learn how to make them. And I started seeing the intensity of the positive emotional reactions that people had as we created with sand globes together. I saw the power in the playful social interactions that came from playing catch with the globes in the process of making them. I saw how universal human affinities for the earth, social connection, beauty, creativity, and play made it easy to overcome social, cultural, and language barriers. I've incorporated sand globe making in many of my local community art making events, partnering with local environmental groups, land stewards, the National Park Service, and local park districts. Combining sand globe art making with beach cleanup work has been an exciting way to link collective creativity and environmental action. I've spread sand globing worldwide through the website sandglobes.org and using social media. People all over the world have posted their own photos and videos using the hashtag sandglobes. Many people have commented that they were surprised that they could learn to make sand globes by just watching my short how-to video, which includes no spoken language. Links to that video are featured on the website and the sand globes social media accounts. Here are some images and messages that I've received from around the world. I love making sand globes in groups. Helps people to understand that life is an ephemeral thing. Making sand globes is really simple and it's surprising and it's fun, educational, and it's, and it's really touching. It takes something we mostly overlook, which is sand, which sort of stands in for the planet all around us, and it just lets us craft it into these whimsical ephemeral globes. It teaches us to be present in nature and to be present with other people and to value the whole process of creation as much as the result. Making sand globes is connecting to the power of life. I've been thrilled that others have begun hosting sand globe gatherings around the world. For example, in Colombia, South America, Carolina Duncan Page included sand globe making in an event with children from the beach conservation group Guardians de la Playa. Children and adults have an innate affinity for nature and the planet. But the planet's at risk, partly due to alienation from the natural world and each other and also because we've used the earth as a resource rather than a beloved habitat. I hope that this project will help strengthen our connection to the planet and inspire creative and communal environmental action. Thanks for watching. I'll pass it back to you, Deanna. Thank you, Zach. That was um, that was really beautiful, actually. I, I really enjoyed watching that. Um, yeah, so you're welcome to put uh, the, the link for Sand Globes Worldwide into the chat in case somebody wants to check that out. And let's move on to the next person. Uh, Lisa, are you? prepared to, I'm trying to find you in the, <laughs> there. Are, you, are you ready to start yours? I am here and now Excellent. I'm Hi. And it's not, I'm going to the open system preferences again. Let me see. Having a little issue. Let's see, there we go, getting closer. Here we come. And the slideshow, yay. Welcome everyone. And uh, technology is uh, 
always a challenge for me. I'm here on uh, unceded Ohlone land as well um, and ready to dive in here. Between life and death lie equity and justice. So begins the cyclical path of the found object assemblage life reimagined a quest, a re-envisioning of the 1960s board game of life, wherein the player with the most cash wins. That version of the game came 100 years after Milton Bradley's The Checkered Game of Life, which had a strong moral message. The 1960s version reflected the Mad Men era of planned obsolescence and perpetual growth. It informed the dominant culture for decades, a culture that oppresses people and extracts resources. Life Reimagined a Quest explores changes that happen by rewriting the very object of the game to build a just and sustainable world. It's a big picture model of the interconnections between various aspects of society, as well as society and nature. There are 21 fields like community, energy, food, and the arts. And the quest is to practice empathy and recognize that which benefits the common good. Lisa, can I yeah. interrupt you for a moment? Sure. Yeah. Um, uh, is everybody seeing the the screen? I Mine is black and it says loading. I see the same thing. Oh no. Okay. Um, are you try closing that and then use the little share screen button at the open it on your desktop and then click the share screen button at the bottom of the this zoom page it's strange that i saw it i could see it okay it's okay no worries we got, we're, we're doing just fine click the example screen are we there can you all see it now anybody um oh it says loading yay you see it now? Yes. Oh, everybody good? Yeah. All right. Okay. All right. Thank you. Well, I'll just go back to that first slide um, because this is where literally on the on the board, although your faces are on the right, um, equity and justice are foundational to the game and to the start of it. And they are between death on the left and life is behind all your faces on the screen. Mm -hmm. um, and so that is the significance of that. Um, okay, and then the second slide was this one, um, where I described their 21 fields and these storytelling, transportation, decolonization are examples of the fields, but there are 21 of those. And then I'll try to pick up from here. The path of creation began 10 years ago to address the fallacy that national health can be measured by gross national product. Nothing grows indefinitely. My favorite image for unsustainability is the exploding blueberry girl in Charlie and the Chocolate Factory. I wanted to contrast the gross national product with the wisdom of Bhutan's gross national happiness index to illustrate the harm caused by consumer capitalism and to demonstrate that racial and social justice is climate justice. Then someone gave my children the game of life. I was a careful consumer of the messages my kids received and the parody hit me immediately. If we are ever to have a just and sustainable world, we have to change the culture. We need to reimagine life. As I considered the concept, I realized that I couldn't create meaningful actions for a playable game on my own. I don't have the lived experience to represent what is needed in communities I'm not a part of, and I needed partners. In order to launch the idea and recruit collaborators, I submitted a concept sketch of sorts for a climate art show in early 2020. Then the pandemic hit, followed by the murder of George Floyd and Breonna Taylor, and the list goes on. And suddenly there was a quasi universal moment of clarity that the major issues of our time, coronavirus, racial injustice, the climate emergency and economic inequality are connected and systemic. Meanwhile, the Green New Deal resolution was written, just one of several frameworks describing what must be addressed in order to remedy systemic issues. 
the time felt right for a model to see it all at once, to fit the pieces together into the giant mosaic that it is. The objects in my assemblage primarily came through my children's little hands and their hearts, their creativity, and my hope for their future was all, are all over the board. Indeed, they are my first collaborators. Most of the collaged images are from children's book covers, often used in my work to highlight the influence of the stories we tell our children's developing, of the influence we tell, I'm sorry, of the influence of the stories we tell on our children's developing worldview. I myself am part of the Lorax and Yertle the Turtle generation. I value and appreciate the illustrators of the beautiful books that I spent hours reading to my snuggly kids and others in preschool classes I taught. I recognize the limits of using symbols for complex issues and invite feedback. My goal is for the game board to be inclusive and to represent every commu community without doing harm. With this artwork in progress, I reached out to my first partner at the Art of the Green New Deal, a San Francisco-based journal of creative culture shift. Through that relationship, I was introduced to Be the Green in Atlanta, a grassroots group dedicated to helping artists promote the Green New Deal. Be the Green also connected with Earth Games at the University of Washington, all sharing the goal of developing a game. And so the Life Reimagined Collaborative was born to create Life Reimagined, a video game in development with my piece as the prototype. The collaborative is made up of over 100 students, teachers, activists, artists, writers, developers, and gamers, and growing who all believe that through the arts and games, we can play our way into a better world. It is designed to turn climate anxiety into climate action. Life Reimagined is a local adventure choice digital game. Players move around the board and choose between three options. They must maintain their self energy in order to contribute to society and long-term sustainability, working together and encountering unexpected events. By reimagining the world we want to create together, we strive for a culture shift to realize a just transition to a sustainable future in time. Because life, after all, is not a game. Thank you, Lisa. Thank you Thank very you. much. Beautifully done. Very, very well presented. I appreciate that. And thank you again for <laughs> shouting out that I wasn't screen sharing. No worries on that. Jeanette, are you ready to go? I have your um, I have your piece ready. Perfect. Yes, I am. Thank you. All right, so um, Jeanette is also having technical issues, so she sent me a Google Doc link with her presentation, so um, I'm going to be showing it. It's not, uh, it, it's, I don't have it in a PowerPoint, so um, you'll see a little bit of the uh, desktop around it, but hopefully that will not be too distracting. Okay, so I'm going to share right now and okay thank you Jeanette Kim are you are muted you have <laughs> Aha, thank you. <laughs> um, thank you, Deanna. <laughs> thank you. Um, can you hear me now? Yes. Good. Okay. Um, I can see two screens at once on an iPhone. Um, so nice to see you all. And um, thank you, Deanna, for bringing us all together. Um, just to give you a bit of context for my work. Um, I am an architectural designer and I've been working on um, a couple of um, urban design schemes that look at um, you know, ways to adapt cities to be more adaptable to sea level rise. And partly because of that work, um, 
I've been looking for ways to guide community decision making processes. Um, and because of that, I've started, to, I've, I got involved in making board games um, that do serve as these kinds of community decision making tools. Um, so I'm excited that one of them is in this show. And um, Deanna, I think you can move ahead. Okay. Thank you. This is the page. Um, Great. So the game I'd like to present today is called Barter Town uh, Next. Um, and this was um, a board game that was commissioned by a state regulatory agency, um, a California state um, agency called um, BCDC, which stands for Bay Conservation and Development Commission. And they wanted to use the game, um, or they did use the game, um, as part of a kind of Bay-wide outreach process. Um, to communicate to their interagency partners and community members um, how sea level rise will impact cities. Um, and their idea was primarily to reinforce this idea that sea level rise impact is not only isolated to areas that are hit by direct flooding, but in fact has these kind of cascading impacts across very complex social networks and supply chains and relationships beyond. Um, so the game is called Barter Town because it imagines a world without money. Um, players uh, perform daily activities around the board. Um, so they might, for example, visit grandma or drive for Uber or go drink bubble tea. Um, and then while this happens, they can trade favors for a ride into town, for example, or maybe just even stay on each other's couches if they can't get home. Um, there are risks too. Um, floods come, which you can see at the center of the board there. Um, and as floods arrive, um, people could get stranded or kind of new alliances start to form. Um, and, you know, these kinds of social networks that have been established across play start to get strained or impacted by these, um, by flooding. Um, at the same time, the players have these infrastructure cards that they can use to build roads or kind of um, protect little areas from flooding. Um, so they kind of have to negotiate amongst themselves how they want to use these infrastructure cards. Um, next, please. Thanks for doing this. <laughs> um, <laughs> so. You, you, <laughs> um, since the original version um, that I made for BCDC, I've also made um, some other versions of Brighter Town that I've played at exhibitions and with community groups and planning agencies um, since. Um, and so, I, and some of these instances you can see here. Um, and then next, please. Um, so the, the first one you saw up above was a tabletop version. Um, the images you're seeing here um, come from a kind of vinyl game that you can roll out on the floor and people can kind of gather around and play. Um, and you can keep scrolling, Deanna, please. Okay. Thank you. Mm. Um, and keep scrolling as well. And keep going. Great. And we can pause here. Um, so basically, um, oh, uh, could you go up just a moment and to see the little five figures up above. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> you um, great, perfect. Okay. I love it. So <laughs> the new version of Brighter Town um, uh, has, uh, so in the, the new version of Brighter Town, each player has a unique power or kind of currency. Um, and so what you see in front of you are the different players um, associated with these powers. Um, so there's a developer, which is on the left, um, a, politician, which is next to that person. In the middle, you see a caregiver. Um, on the right to that, on the ladder is a designer. And then the rightmost player is the nomad. Um, and you can go ahead. Um, in fact, you can probably just keep scrolling as I talk during this part. So the developer has the power to seize buildings as private property and charge other players to use them. The designer who's coming up now um, can change connections across buildings um, in relationship to the floodplain. Um, the following player who you'll see in a moment is the nomad. Um, oh, actually, sorry, that is not the nomad, but um, 
I guess you could pause right here. Um, so the nomad, oh yeah, that's great. Actually, you can pause there, please. <laughs> um, this is not the nomad, but I'll talk about the nomad in a moment. Um, the nomad gets a divorce at the beginning of the game and loses her home. Um, but she does have the power of being able to travel twice as fast as any other player um, and can basically squat sites in ways that like sort of take illegal action <laughs> in sites that other players can't do. Um, the caregiver who you do see here can give rides to other players and offer her home for other players to sleep in. And then please keep, keep scrolling. Um, and then the last player who's a politician um, has the power to redistribute um, infrastructure tiles or basically redistribute wealth. Um, in this case, we um, what you're looking at here is this version of Barter Town that we built in Berlin. And in this case, the actual mayor of Hamburg Mitte is in the image playing the mayor. So I was like playing the politician. He's incredibly diplomatic and really good at what he did. <laughs> um, okay, so you can move forward, please. Um, and I think here you can just keep scrolling um, as I talk. Um, so I've played the game in a, about uh, almost, I guess, like 18 times, uh, approximately. And um, across these different times, um, almost every player has won more than once, um, suggesting that there can be parity among otherwise very divergent powers. Um, in one event, for example, the architect kind of sold out their skills to the developer and built this kind of very large mega zone that only the two of them could use. That was the least cooperative version I've ever seen. <laughs> uh, and actually, you could pause here, please. Um, in another case, um, though, you could see that grassroots strategies can also win. Um, one time, the caregiver won, in fact, by the largest margin to date, um, by carrying all of the other players everywhere he traveled and then collaborated with them along the way. Um, and then, um, or in another example, which you see here, um, in the, this is the most cooperative version of the game I've seen yet. Um, and in this case, all the players basically just joined up together and created a kind of new commune up in the hills <laughs> um, and shored up the lower low lying areas where all the stores and public spaces were. And then were able to kind of essentially like retreat to a new settlement. Um, Ultimately, um, I think Barter Town exists not necessarily because I'm trying to promote the idea of a barter society, but because when we take away money from the relationship from relationships, we also understand forms of care and exchange that are much more socially driven. Um, so I think there are a couple of things that I hope these games do. Um, one is that I think they they have and can help help communities understand, just kind of play out and imagine how sea level rise impacts um, daily life and um, inequities and different advantages that currently exist in cities. Secondly, I think the games allow people to role play and just kind of step outside of their own frame of mind and imagine how different alliances can in fact be made possible by disasters like sea level rise. And I think that's where these characters and their different powers are important to me because um, you, you start to understand that there are different tactics that people can use when they're anticipating these massive changes. So, you know, we, we typically think that the people who have the most power and the most money are going to be the ones that have the most leverage. But in this case, we can also start to imagine how care and dependent, interdependency and even the literal changing of our physical environment can also have quite a lot of power as well. All right, thank you for listening. Oh, thank you so much, Jeanette. That looked like a lot of fun, as well as being just a really smart way to um, try out things and get people to think differently. I really, really appreciate that. Um, so Lauren, I see Verda is here. Would you guys be ready to go next? You're muted, both of you. Yes. Um, <clears throat> what about Dan and Mary? Um, they, uh, they're going to go last. Okay. And Nanette and um, 
and Kent actually they they lost power due to the windstorm, so they're oh. not going to be here either. Well, that's a shame. It's a real shame. Yeah, but at least some of us are making it. So, all right. Well, I will start this and. I'm going to view full screen. I'm going to be sharing my time with uh, Berta, who was a major collaborator on this piece. And I don't want to disregard the participation of Lisa also. Um, <clears throat> when you, if, when you visit the gallery, you'll notice at the entrance, there's a collection of paper mache tombstones and they're there to honor species, animal species that have gone into extinction. This was an idea that came to me walking through a very large cemetery here in the neighborhood, uh, which I have to say is the unceded territory of the Ohlone, AKA Oakland. So this is the Mountain View Cemetery, which we'll see in a moment. Uh, it was a, a very big vision and I thought I need collaborators to make this happen. I love working with collaborators. I would love to share this. And I had recently been introduced to a group called Extinction Rebellion, uh, the East Bay chapter. And uh, I thought, perfect. They're a group of folks that love to use creativity out on the streets as a way to disrupt um, life, business as usual, and to call attention um, to the awful consequences of our overdependence on oil. So I just grabbed this recent action that they did in London, which is their home base, where the, it's a protest against Coca-Cola, and they're equating the liquid in the bottles with the oil that's used to fabricate the bottles. Um, so they're, they're pledged to nonviolent action. They use a lot of disruptive performance and they're, they have a non-hierarchical structure, which is wonderful. Anybody can show up with an idea and say, what do you think? You wanna, are you on board with this? And then we start to host um, art builds, which are, are really joyous occasions. <laughs> um, so I wanted to make a cemetery, you know, move this along here. Hello. It's not moving. Wonder why. You have a little set of arrows at the bottom of your screen somewhere, sometimes. When you're in share screen, it uses uh, these. Nope. I'm used to just clicking on the image and having it come up. Yeah. Um, Maybe arrows on your keyboard, Lauren? I'm using the arrows on the keyboard and nothing's moving. It's very peculiar because I got from one to two. Uh. Any any tech people out there with an idea? There we go. There we go. There okay. we go. A slow okay. maybe. Mm -hmm. um, so I mentioned this, uh, the Mountain View Cemetery, which is here in Oakland. It's over 200 acres, and it was designed by Frederick Law Olmsted, who's the father of landscape architecture in this country. And if you don't know about him, I hope you find the occasion to do so. What this man accomplished was absolutely jaw-dropping. Everything from master plans for the campuses for Stanford, Berkeley, or the University of Chicago, to the design of the park at Niagara Falls, to uh, this gorgeous cemetery, uh, uh, community, uh, 
gosh, he designed entire communities. He came up with a master plan for Los Angeles so that what we in place of the freeways, there were going to be wooded parkways connecting parks. I mean, the man was utterly visionary and believed in having the relationship between man and nature in proper proportion. Uh, unfortunately, what happened was that his patrons seized this opportunity to create these elaborate Victorian mausoleums for their families. Um, and I thought, my goodness, there's a lot of money, ego, energy that goes into recognizing humans and not very much that goes into recognizing the th millions of creatures we share on this the planet with. So I said, let's start to make tombstones to honor these animals, which can then be out in public. And were the bank open, this would create an obstacle course for people to get into the bank, but they know we would come in and pull down the shades and said, yeah, we're not going to do business today. Let them have their demonstration. So we did anyway. Um, but the idea is that it's a portable cemetery. It can be picked up and paraded and plopped down wherever we need to create a visual focus. And it was created by many, many, many patient hands through many hours of building um, in my shop. So one thing I'd love to do is share a video or a portion of a video that was created right after the tombstones were made. And there you can see Lisa hiding behind the black cloak. Um, we started the project shortly before COVID hit. And the consensus was that it would be ugh, maybe not the best idea to be out parading tombstones in public at that point in history. But not to be deterred, the um, ever ingenious members of XR approached the uh, director of the El Cerrito Cemetery here in the East Bay and said, hi, we'd like to bring our tombstones over and do an action. And he said, fine. And this whole thing was directed and shot in the course of a morning. And I think it's just brilliant. Um, so we'll watch a few minutes of it. It manages to meld the COVID crisis with the uh, species extinction crisis in a very moving way, I think. And it's on YouTube. Lauren, um, yes. can you pause? Can you pause? This? Yes. Can everybody, can anybody see this? Uh, what I see on my screen is a, a gray square that says video unavailable. Oh. That's what I see as well. Huh. Yeah, it's running. Um, um, I think you're going to have to do a stop sharing and then select a different window and start sharing again. Okay, thank you for that um, hint. Um, -na -na -na. There's resume share. I don't see. Oh, there's stop share. Okay, so what I can do is go to. Um, Maybe what I should do while I'm dithering around is, is let Verda speak. Um, I'm sorry about that. It was playing just fine on my screen. Maybe this will do it. Can you hear it? Um, um, nothing right now. OK. Um, I don't see a share screen button right at the moment. Oh, because I'm out of Zoom. Okay, Lauren. I beg your pardon. I had tried it, um, and I it was playing on my machine. Yes, Lauren, very, I'll just go right yes. now while you yeah. figure I'll it out. Around. Yeah, I would love to see that video. I haven't seen it yet. <laughs> okay. um, and I remember that time because it was deep in the heart of the pandemic. And I don't want to add too much more because I am one of Lauren's collaborators, which I love. I love the idea of collaborating on work, artwork, and um, being listed that way. And Diana, thank you so much for this opportunity to participate in this wonderful show. It's, it, it's been fantastic. I'm coming to the closing. I hope everyone here is also as well. And just real quick, 
thinking about what you said about play, I'll just run through my slides. I'm, I try to give myself two minutes because I knew I was tacking on to Lauren. Um, I started out, I had a career in design for many, many years and then came back and got a second degree, second master's degree in fine arts. And Lauren was one of my professors very early on. And that's how we met, very first met. And I brought this tradition of model making for my architecture practice and, and to, and to um, my art practice. And this is, this is kind of that merging of that. This was a show that I had very, a few years after my second master's degree at the San Jose Museum of Art. It was a, just a cardboard model and it was part of this show called Road Trip. And I then I was still working in design and trying to figure out how to merge design and art. And my studies at San Francisco Art, art Institute were around performative art, social sculpture, installation art. And I was thinking about how to merge those and connect more with the community. And these are just a couple of examples of how I played with my design practice and my art practice. And this is an art piece where I, the, um, people making the art weren't, weren't me. I, I set up the parameters and then it was the community that created the art by creating these workspaces. And this one was a, an exploration. This was in Milan, Italy. The last one is in Charleston, South Carolina. This was in Milan, Italy, where I explored a, a, a very futuristic idea of workplace and merged it with a very dystopian view of um, dwindling resources, specifically in California, like the lack of water and how we might come together as a human species around this idea of water. And this culminated in this project where I really wanted to take my design team out into the world. And so we converted a food truck into a mobile design lab and called it the food for thought truck and partnered with communities all up and down California from LA to San Francisco and um, mostly nonprofits around what their communities might need, want, might, might need help with or resolution with around design. And we helped implement those projects. And last of all, and just this is how this all comes back to Extinction Rebellion and my love for action um, peaceful action and trying to sway my own personal industry. I've been really heavily involved in how to to change minds within my interior design firm and my industry and created this playbook. This was in 2021 around how to design with the future in mind. And it's downloadable. Um, you can go to my website and a lot of these projects are on my firm website and I'll add them to the chat after this. But Thank you all for your time. Thank you, Verda. Hopefully, Lauren, you've got this figured out. <laughs> no, because I couldn't access it well. But oh. What I'm going to do is put Lauren. the link in the chat and people yeah. can copy it and go to it. It's a very moving little three-minute piece. It's a Victorian funeral in the um graveyard where they're placing flowers on the on the gray the in front of the tombstones and then there's this moment of resolution and unity at the end and it's it's a great little piece thank so you I'll put it in the chat thanks for everybody's indulgence thank you both of you um and, and i think that's really important to remember that even though the topic is dark that we can still use creativity, you know, that the idea of theater, of using that as a, a way of, um, it is a form of play still, even if the topic is dark. So um, Mary and Daniel, are you guys ready to share your piece? I think I've got everybody. We are. Yeah. yeah. So we're going to share screen. Do you have the, uh, okay. Let's please. get there. Yeah. Okay. Great. Everybody see a full screen here? Okay. 
I guess that means yes. Yeah. So um, we're Mary O'Brien and Daniel McCormick and our um, practice is Studio of Watershed Sculpture, which the name indicates we work mostly in the field and mostly on public or public domain lands. Um, and we're just going to go through a few of our projects in relationship to um, some of the themes of this exhibition. Um, we actually consider um, best practices when we approach our works. And we look back over the past 30 plus years and we realize that we have some common best practices that go along with every project that we do. And we believe that's what makes them successful. Um, and, and you'll see when we show you, they're all very different lands and different um, issues in on the land in different communities. So um, first thing, first principle, the first practice is we follow the science. And uh, this is sky opening. That was also on the first slide, and uh, a, a drone view of it. Um, this is a reforestation project in Northern Michigan. And we really relied on the science of reforestation, um, the research that had been done in this area of the country um, where there was a lot of logging, this is a second growth, and local experts. And th that combination really brought us through, allowed us to create this um, design, uh, which was to take the reforestation, turn it on its head, and uh, turn it into a sculpture. Um, go on. Uh, this is a project down in Palo Alto, California. Um, it engaged several hundred hours of uh, volunteers to build it. It's a structure to restore the habitat for the uh, uh, burrowing owl. And uh, it's been pretty effective. It was about two, three years ago. Right. And, and, and we had several people from uh, around South County and San Francisco and East Bay come and work on this. Um, this. This habitat is really meant to bring bugs to the, to the land so that the burrowing owl can find them. That's what this does. Um, our next practice is we use local resources. It's real important to us to source sustainable materials from the site or, or genetically close to the site. Um, this is our Bay Clay Oyster Reef, uh, meant as um, uh, waterfront protection during sea level rise. Um, it does attract oysters, then oysters attract more oysters. And the idea for any kind of oyster reef is to turn it into an oyster bed that that precedes the uh, shoreline um, grasses and marshes so it sits in the water um, and the clay here that we use this is these are ceramic is actually taken from the bay these are the uh, leftover solids that came down through the river system from the gold rush over 150 years ago are still in our bay and they're still visible so that's that's our local resources. Um, this one shows a little bit of the before and after. You kind of see how we're making sausage here. Um, there are three different views of this. The first one is how we discovered it. Um, the Park Service had tried to kill a pretty strong invasive um, and spent the winter doing it and, and brought us down to the site. And you see that upper, upper picture of just this dirt uh, stream bank, um, the structure that we wove, and this again, uh, the, the neighborhood, uh, people from all over. This is a lot of community hours. Yeah, the Silicon Valley, a lot of the companies would come down and do their, yeah. their um, volunteer day. So we had, we had a lot of great uh, strength and, and a lot of interested people. Um, and what we, what we share with them is um, our knowledge, our research. Uh, so they don't just come and do, you know, labor with us. They actually come and engage with us and, and share our creative vision for this. Um, so that is the other one of the principles. And, and we'll go to this. This is, this is in the exhibition at Artworks Downtown. Um, uh, this is um, really the very plain title of Floodplain Wall. And here, 
ex is an example of what we find one of the most important principles that we need in order to complete a project, and that is create a high conservation value. This is a floodplain wall, so in the distance you see the Carson River at flood stage, and this structure really involved three months, 1,600 volunteer hours of people in the neighborhood that came to work with us, and literally the neighborhood. When you, when you go out into the country like this, people within 50 miles are definitely the neighborhood. Um, a lot of these folks had, had never really been to this river, and it was until the Nature Conservancy took over this ranch, turned it into public domain, that they actually were able to see the Carson River, because there's a lot of privatized land up there. This is the sculpture last week, 10 the, years later. The lower right. Yeah, you see it in the lower right. You can see the, the kind of the heart-shaped curves. That's the full structure, oh. the full sculpture. And this compliments of Jeff Martinez, KTVN Reno, who I follow on Facebook, and his drone camera, he did a nice job, is what it looks like full flood stage, but also the snow. So you can see what, what when we actually started on this project in 2013 in the month of January, and it kind of looked like this without our sculpture. So we just wanted to throw that one in. That's our extra slide. So I'm gonna stop sharing. If I can get up there. It's hard to get your mouse back. There we go. Okay, are we back? Yeah. Thank you. Thank you very much. I think it's really interesting to watch the progression and um, of that piece. And people may not realize how much the 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 land has actually healed, in um, the marsh has actually healed. If I'm right, with the with the with your piece there. So uh, that's everybody who was able to make it. Um, there were three artists or artist pairs who were not able to make it. Um, and, but you can always learn more about all of them on the website or by purchasing a catalog. We're gonna open up now for um, questions and feel free to uh, either address your question to one of the specific artists or to um, the, the whole group, the panel in general. Um, so if, if you, Feel free to start and you can raise your hand if somebody else is speaking and you want to go next um, and we'll just open it up in terms like that. So does anybody have a, a question to start with? I'm going to look in the chat. You can put your question in the chat if you haven't um, already uh, written one down for yourself. I see a lot of movement, so I can't, am I not sure if I've got everybody on because I think we've got a couple pages here of people. Um, anybody, am I missing somebody um, who might be speaking? Okay, well, I'm gonna start with just one question to throw out kind of as an icebreaker. Um, so, there are very few schools or um, places where a person can learn to become an ecological artist or socially engaged artist. It's not, it's very, it's very uncommon to find a place um, to learn to do it. And um, I was wondering if any of you have any advice for somebody who might wanna take the practice that they currently have um, as maybe as a gallery artist, maybe a, or a sculptor or something, or and um, uh, and suggestions on how they would might a new <laughs> sorry little nerves. Um, do you have any advice for people who would like to become more socially engaged or more ecologically engaged with their work? And that's I'm opening that up to anybody who might have a comment. <laughs> <laughs> um, okay. <laughs> well, I know with Mary and, and um, Daniel that- they I'll respond to that. Okay, great. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, 
there are uh, there actually is a new uh, artist in residence for uh, e ecological artists mm -hmm. uh, in uh, North Carolina that's just being put together, and uh, they have several uh, scientists uh, in the region to, uh, that are doing projects all over. Anyway, I think the idea is to hook up the artists with scientists and you know have uh, have some dialogue and use the sciences uh, man best management practices uh which are implemented by the uh environmental protection agency and uh see what they can do see uh see how they interpret it there's a lot of interpretations for, uh for various uh um uh biological endeavors like creek restoration or anything like that there's a certain amount of practices that go along with that and uh so you know it's something you can learn another another avenue is to uh, uh find projects that you can get involved with even mm -hmm. as a volunteer you know to learn to to learn what's going on um and there's uh there's also it, 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 i'm just gonna it's easy for someone to take a chance and you know and we're talking about policymakers, scientists, landowners, land stewards, it's easier for them to take a chance on somebody if you're willing to work with them. So, you know, how do you even get notice? And one thing that both of us have done separately, and that's actually what brought us together, is volunteered in our lives for, for uh, causes that we were very passionate about. And if you know of any of these, they grab up people and you just work your way into something and if you don't you gain enough knowledge that to go move on you know and, you design you know, something or you yeah. move, you know you you move to another site it takes a while um it's not an art that's really recognized that's why we so much appreciate artworks downtown thank you stan and thank you elizabeth and thank you deanna for putting this together because these are rare shows they shouldn't be this rare but yeah. um you know we're glad to come out of covid with this uh rather than something that you know has to be um you know painted or you know i mean nothing against that art but it's it's somewhat neglected people don't understand it as much as they should and i saw o'halloran center but i think they're gone they were here oh yeah they, they actually have a call going on right now yeah for everybody, everybody that was in that show certainly qualified yeah too. so uh, i i'm sad maybe they'll look at the tape i'm sad they left early but um, as Daniel says, we're actually involved in helping facilitate and design. Um, and I, I put the link in the, um, in the chat. It's a long, it's a long ways for someone on the West coast, but we are finding people in the East are interested. It's in the Blue Ridge mountains. Um, it's so, beautiful. you know, we're, What's you know, we, we all need to kind of just keep plugging it just keep, keep going through this. Yes, Lauren. Uh, the name of the program? It's called Wild Acres. It's in the chat. Ah, thank you. The link's that's in the chat. Your program, correct? That yes. Wild Acres it's a program that we're helping design. Yeah. Yeah. And you mentioned another one. Um, could you just maybe type that into the chat? That's as the well? one we're talking. Is yeah, that something? that is the one. It's just that oh. one. You can also Thank get uh, at the junior colleges and and stuff. You can get you can take classes in watershed uh, uh, watershed issues, uh, watershed management, uh, management and things like that. And you'll collect a lot of information and then, uh, and then going to implement it is, uh, is, is a different situation, but, uh, it, that's the start is to, uh, gain some knowledge so you can, uh, sit down with a ranger and, and talk about a, a solution you're proposing and they'll understand what you're talking about because you're using the same language, the man, the management practices that the EPA has established, which, you know, and they're plus or minus, uh, but that's the starting point to, uh, to, to do some regenerative, regenerative work. And, and that's kind of what we did when, when we looked at the body of our work, those, that list of principles that we put on each of those slides is is the commonality of every every one of our project has that in common, um, mm -hmm. and a part of that we did take from the the research and the knowledge and the informing of ourselves. And I think you take a chance on it, and people realize, you know, 
I can let this artistic vision come into this project. And that's really what you want is that door to be open that you can bring uh, your artistic vision into a very specific science and or data project. Mm -hmm. yeah. Be compatible in the uh, problem solving process, right? given the knowledge. I Thank you. I, I, I just wanted to yeah. pose a, a little bit of a counter to that. Um, I, I'm, I was raised by a scientist and I kind of went towards the all the way the other way towards art. And I think that, you know, we could look at the human experience also and and even just artists that have done this type of participatory art, we can look at examples like you, you, you presented a few like Robert Smithson and Andrew, Andrew Goldsworthy and others, Andy Goldsworthy and others. But um, I think of when I had the food truck in Bakersfield, I, this um, art professor brought his class to my food truck and they were talking about their participant. They brought, he was so excited because I, he's like, oh my God, participatory social sculpture art here in Bakersfield and I can bring my class to them. And this one student, I was blown away, he was working on a project where he was going to bring yoga, yoga moves, yoga, uh, yoga practice to the migrant workers in Bakersfield. So it's, it, to me, art is about connecting a need to a human experience. Mm -hmm. and, and yes, sometimes science is involved, but not always. Thank you. Yeah. Um, Jeanette has had her hand up. So sorry, Jeanette. No, it's good. We've got time for everyone. Mm -hmm. um, I was reluctant to answer the question because I'm an architect and not an artist, but I think in a way that relates, um, I think a great way to do eco art and to do socially engaged work is to collaborate with people and to um, recognize what unique skills you know one brings into that mix. Um, I think in my own case, um, I I guess I think of my process as one in which, you know, I'm bringing to the table my ways of seeing cities politically and just simple techniques of making models, you know, and like the models kind of play into the way that games then enact certain relationships. And then it's just been amazing and fun to work with mm -hmm. planners and activists and ecologists and to see, to understand how to kind of translate and provoke the work that they're doing. But, you know, to come from a, actually a very different perspective when you do that. Mm -hmm. Do you find that they play very differently when they approach your game, if you're talking to students versus other professionals? Very much. Um, I have a different game that I've played a little bit more with public partners. And I found that, um, well, I don't want to stereotype people too much, but I have found that, for example, a lot of community activists play that game to kind of test out like rhetorical strategies. Um, but I've also seen others who are maybe come from like an engineering background, uh, like civic, civil, civil engineering background, use the game to kind of problem solve and optimize. But then I think in a nice way, some of the games push everybody to kind of think outside of those um, tendencies as well. So mm -hmm. the engineer had to think rhetorically <laughs> and the activists had to think kind of, you know, about <laughs> tendencies to optimize. So I found that really interesting. Mm, mm, interesting. Other comments? I know I Janie, you commented in the um in the chat that you also do you want to follow up on the question I asked? Maybe. Um not sure. Janie had written something. Yeah, there I am. I'm un unmuted now. Excellent. Uh, you asked the question I had in in my head, but I didn't quite know how to ask it. Mm -hmm. Um I, I am an artist, a painter, and I'm very concerned about the environment and my work for the past eight or 10 years has been painting uh, work related to the ocean, mainly. I'm also connect, working in images of people who are at the ocean, that sort of thing. And it's all fun and lovely and all that, but it's not really getting the hook in that I want about ecology and doing something other than making pretty paintings so um i appreciate any suggestions that folks have given i mean uh yeah dan and mary had some you know really good ideas and um well several people did and they're talking 
And I, um, anyway, I'm going to follow up too, I think, with the, uh, is it, what's his name? The uh, sand, <laughs> the sand globe idea. I think I might want to send him uh, email and look at his website because my work is also very related to the ocean. It's my passion. And I'm so impressed with the way he's been able to kind of connect what he's doing with people and getting them involved. So this is all just great fodder for, you know, for me, for learning how to take the next step in that direction. Good. Congratulations. Zach, did you want to respond to that at all? <laughs> You're I was, yeah, I was, I was thinking about everybody as an artist. Um, and then my mom, my mom was a painter and she would say, but not everyone is a painter. <laughs> so so um, for a painter who wants to become socially engaged and make eco art, um, that requires the ingredient that I think is most important, which is connecting your specific passion and your skills with other people in some way. So you pointed out, you used the phrase pretty pictures as if that was, you know, merely pretty pictures, but that's something that you bring. Mm -hmm. So finding a way to bring that and connect it with other people, I think is where the, you know, where the key is not you you have to find your own key. I didn't find my key right away. It took a long time before I found the keys I'm using now. But yeah, I appreciate that idea. Mm -hmm. Lisa, I know you have worked with painters on murals. Um, do you want to respond to that? Um, yeah, I wasn't thinking of it from that standpoint, but um, you know that that kind of goes to what Mary and Daniel were saying about um, volunteering mm -hmm. and having that be a, a means of connecting with you know people who have similar interests and concerns and then bringing your talent. And with, to follow on with what Zach was just saying, it's it's a strong premise in our game that, you know, you, you have to start, it's a very overwhelming when you think about kind of the huge scope of the issues and how they're all related and everything has, um, you know, some implication for our consumption, for our systemic problems, for the climate crisis, for all, all of those things can be very overwhelming, but when we start to tune in to what is it that, what is my unique perspective? Mm -hmm. Artists, I feel um, beyond the skills and the technical training that we have, we have a perspective that we bring, mm -hmm. um, how, how to bring that to bear. What's the story you wanna tell? What's the, the message that you wanna bring and, and to whom? Mm -hmm. and, and then beginning to kind of dig under that and to figure out how how I'm gonna I'm gonna work and collaborators I think I think that's a I think on some level all of us had a collaborative aspect right Diana mm -hmm. yeah yeah it's it once if you go out into the world it's impossible not to really I I think mm -hmm. um da uh Daniel or Mary you look you have a hand up on your Screen? Oh yeah, I, I I just like to respond to the uh, idea of solutions. Mm -hmm. uh, one of the uh, issues will will be, according to the scientists that have been uh, studying this for over half a century, uh, they're saying uh, some of the solutions are going to be adaptation, um, and you know that's a uh, that's that's they say we're not going to be in the same kind of world in 20 to 50 years. So we're connecting and connected to an uncertain future. And that causes a little bit of anxiety with, with all of this. Um, I don't know where it goes from there, but I wanted to mention that adaptation is going to be an issue that uh, we're going to be dealing with. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. We've got a couple more questions in the um, chat. I'm going to <clears throat> I'm going to read both of them and um, <clears throat> and let you choose. You know, if you want to respond to one or the other. Um, the first question is: Can you speak to the moments your work pro inspires proactive responsibility for ecological 
or social engagement? Can you speak to the moments that your work inspires proactive responsibility? And the second one is how do you nurture your own motivation to avoid burnout and maintain momentum? I know I, I thought of something similar before this was like, how do you remain hopeful? You know, I know, I know sometimes I actually struggle with that and be, you finish a project, you feel really hopeful while you're doing it. And then as an artist, I struggle sometimes. Anybody want to respond to that? How do you maintain hope? Lauren. Um, I think one of the ways that, that I have recharged my batteries and is by working with children. And a lot of things that we feel are can you hear me all right yes okay. we're, appla we're applauding oh. <laughs> um, a lot of the things that we see of as overwhelming problems they just see as interesting problems to solve mm -hmm. and they bring all of their amazing creativity into the play of making solutions and i keep going where are the grown-ups looking over their shoulders and going yes of course it's really remarkable um i was able to do a um, a wonderful collaborative project with the hayward shoreline interpretive center several mm -hmm. years ago they do a summer camp called bay campers uh, in which the children learn every aspect of the bay that they're that's part of their life and I was able to make a topographic model of the shoreline and the kids would build all the little cities and factories and roads and yada, 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 and this model. And then we, it was sitting in a, a long sink. And then we go away and we go look at slides of cultures that lived a kind of water-based life. And I'd leave the water running. And when we came back, all their little cities were bobbing, <laughs> floating. <laughs> <laughs> and they kind of had a moment of going ah <laughs> ah and then we gave them materials and we said okay how are you going to solve some of these problems the the freeways flooded how are you going to get to work oh you know uh there are people that are stuck out in the bay or you know and so they would they, i mean they just came up with brilliant brilliant responses um in a very kind of natural way. They had rescue boats and party boats and floating farms and um, uh, water taxis and seaplanes. And they were having the time of their lives coming up with um, solutions. So I got to share in that and then turn around and share it with the adult community. So maybe that's a Pollyanna view of things, but um, I, I feel like artists are uniquely poised at this time in history to bring creativity forward and ask, what if, what if we tried this? Which is what everybody here is doing. I know I felt really inspired just looking at Lauren's website and seeing the images of the children playing. So you might uh, Google, <laughs> Google Lauren. <laughs> so, um, Lisa, you have your hand up. Whoops, you're still muted. Sorry. Um, the act of imagining is actually a, a proactive um, thing. There's science that tells us that when we when we're able to reimagine, uh, to imagine something, we're able to uh, to be prepared for it because the scenario somehow, you know, when you're watching a, a movie about a dystopian movie about cultures that you know get down the last of us or something like that and people are playing a role then you're imagining somewhere in your in your brain what would I do what would my strength be I'd want to be a food in food production or defense would be my thing or um and the 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 uh one of the leading voices on that I think is Jane McGonigal who wrote a book called Imaginable and she does she creates games that are all role-playing that have to do with being able to envision um, scenarios and figure out what you would do and there's I, she's a scientist too a social scientist and so she she can document that it does actually effectively 
um, help you be prepared. So I think just seeing artwork that allows us to see, um, you know, what, what different possibilities are it is a proactive mm -hmm. effort. Nicely said, nicely stated. Who else has any questions? We've had several quiet um, audience members. Um, feel free right now if you want to put your hand up for anything. Um, don't be shy, everybody's shy. <laughs> and um, if that's it, I think that might be it. I, I think we're probably ready to close now, Stan. Thank you so much. Okay. Wow. Thank you. I'm here. <laughs> Thank you, everyone. I'm uh, very speechless. Uh, I'm just trying to retain everything that I just absorbed. Uh, so thank you so much. I always uh, really, really want to thank artists for doing these art talks because uh, and um, not only do they create the concepts and then find the uh, bravery and the energy to um, perform those concepts, a lot of times they, uh, you know, created in a visual way and they're already communicating to people. So then to come and put it into words and to, to go over it again in a new way to me is yet uh, even more devotion to their vision and their commitment to the community and their willingness to participate and, and share that vision. So it's just like, you just keep digging deeper and deeper and there's that endless wealth of creativity and connectivity. So thank you so much for all the work that you do and for participating tonight. Uh, and uh, thank you to everybody who joined us and was able to receive that uh, work and is undoubtedly inspired to take it and uh, do what you will with it in, in your uh, reality and with your people. And um, so uh, bravo to everybody here.